Welcome to HowToStats.com. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to do some basic analyses uh, within the context of the CAPM uh, model, which is frequently uh, cited on the internet in books and journals. Uh, but what I've noticed is that uh, a lot of analyses that are conducted in this uh, context are rarely done so in SPSS. Uh, and I find mostly it's uh, done within SAS, and I even see a lot of uh, examples demonstrated on the internet using SAS, uh, but uh, I haven't found an example using SPSS, and I can't see any reason why, oh, I couldn't, and I definitely don't see a reason why uh, SPSS can't do the same type of basic analyses within the CAPM context, and in particular, estimating alpha and beta. And the example I'm going to demonstrate today is actually based on a SAS example, which uh, can be found at this uh, URL, which is on the SAS website. And what they've done is they've uh, taken, I believe, real data uh, from Tandy Corporation, which uh, I understand is owned by Radio Shack these days and is no longer listed on the stock market. But this example uses stock returns from the T Tandy Corporation, and they have a market index, uh, the S&P, they say the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. In terms of what data they're using, I don't know exactly uh, what they're using, whether it's the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones. Uh, I say it's the S&P 500. I haven't double-checked if it is or not. And the data are monthly uh, returns uh, from January 1978 through de December uh, 1987. And what they do is a very basic uh, CAPM uh, analysis uh, with linear regression. And uh, I'm going to do the same analysis in SPSS and come up with exactly the same values. So what we have here are data for monthly returns, S&P 500. I believe it's the S&P 500. It could be the Dow Jones. Uh, Treasury bill returns and Tandy Corporation monthly returns. First thing that the SAS example does is calculate the risk premium variables, which is S&P 500 minus treasury bills. They're basically residuals. So to do that in SPSS, we go into the compute variable, and we're going to call it S&P 500 risk premium. So that's going to be this variable minus treasury bill. Click OK. And that produces a variable called S&P 500 RP. And I'm going to do the same thing for Tandy. Tandy and uh, Tandy minus Treasury bill. Click OK. And we've got our two variables that we're going to actually do our analyses uh, with. And the first thing that the SAS example does is does a linear regression, uh, does a scatter plot to examine the uh, association between S&P 500 risk premium and Tandy RP. I don't know why they did that exactly. You could do that with a correlation much more quickly. I'm going to do it very quickly here just to show you that it can be done quite simply. So we've got uh, the S&P 500 RP. I'm using a simple scatter plot. We go Tandy RP Y axis, and we click OK, and it, SPSS produces the graph. And what we're looking for here is some kind of positive association between uh, S and P 500 RP and Tandy RP, which basically means that the the index return and the Tandy stock return uh, are correlated. And we can see here that they are. The chart is a bit bigger than the one that you'll find on the on the SAS website. I'll just shrink it down a bit. Click OK. And I believe the scale values on the axes might be slightly different uh, on the website. But basically this is the, the linear trend that we can see a positive correlation going from left to right. Now the next thing that the uh, SAS example does is, is the nuts and bolts of the analysis, which is a linear regression. And you can do that in SPSS very simply. You go into regression, you click linear, and we're going to use our S&P RP uh, 
variable as an independent variable, which means that tandrp is a dependent variable, so tandrp regressed onto independent rp. Now, the SAS example asked for a few statistics that aren't automatically outputted in SPSS, but we can click them pretty quickly. Uh, for one, uh, what SAS doesn't give us is the confidence intervals. It probably could if you asked for a few other, if you specified some syntax to do so. But in SPSS, you're going to have to, and I'll explain in a minute why. The residuals, we got Durbin Watson to test for the possibility that there's an autocorrelation, which is frequently done as a part of the analysis, a CAPM analysis. And we've got descriptives here, which I would just click as a matter of course, because you want to look at your means and standard deviations pretty much in every uh, context of a basic analysis. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click a uh, save button. I'm going to uh, save the residuals. So these are the res unstandardized residuals because the SAS example calculates uh, in the end a, a chart which I also think is probably a little bit redundant with some other information but we've got the residuals here that are going to be basically the predicted residual values of the Tandy RP variable so whatever's left over that's not predicted by the S&P 500 RP variable so we'll click OK and that's going to create a variable upon which we can calculate some uh, some charts and, and one chart in particular so we click OK to run the analysis. And we've got our standard deviations and means uh, here. The SAS example doesn't talk about that. I th in a standard CAPM analysis, I'd probably be interested in looking at that kind of thing. But for the purposes of strict comparison, I'm not going to talk about that very much right now. We can see that there's a correlation of 0 uh, 0.565 between TAN DRP and S&P 500 RP risk premium, uh, which again means that uh, is basically a numerical representation of the first chart that I created. Uh, there's a pretty robust correlation between Tandy returns and uh, S&P 500 returns once you subtract uh, treasury bills from the uh, return, which is the, uh, the uh, residual variable we created. Oh, we go down a bit lower, we get the model summary, uh, and we can tell that 0.565 is equal to 0.319, which is a, a value reported in the SAS example, which means 31.9% of the variance in Tandy's risk premium uh, can be accounted for by the S&P 500 risk premium. We have the Durbin-Watson statistic here, and one uh, arguably important difference between SPSS and SAS is that uh, SPSS does not give a statistical significance value associated with the Durbin-Watson statistic, uh, but it could be argued that um, you would interpret this value based more from an effect size standpoint, so you'll frequently come across a rule of thumb that Durbin-Watson values between 1.5 and 2.5 should satisfy any concern of violating the assumption of no autocorrelation across time, uh, because all these values are monthly values and they're sequentially ordered uh, in, the out, in the data and you might get an autocorrelation. Uh, in this case, the Durbin-Watson value is 1.933. Very conf Well, we're pretty confident that there's not an autocorrelation violation here. Uh, we go down further. You could interpret the ANOVA table. I'm not going to bother because it's... Uh, I guess it's just telling us that this correlation of 0.565 is actually statistically significant. I suppose it's important, but in a linear regression context, we're going to get some redundant information in the next table, which is where the meat and potatoes of the analysis finds itself. Uh, what we have is a, a re-reporting of the of the correlation, which in the context of regression is a standardized beta weight, 0.565, with a t-value of 7.437. This is redundant with this information here. Uh, but the crux, we've got the um, S&P 500 RP as an independent variable predicting Tandy RP beta value of 1.05. And in the SAS example, we uh, specifically tested whether this would be greater or lesser than 1.0000. 000. 
and there was a p-value associated with that in the SAS example. I can't remember what it was exactly, but it was very much not statistically significant. In SPSS, you don't get a p-value per se. What you get are arguably uh, more informative pieces of information. You get the 95% confidence intervals associated with b. And so we've got 0.77 as the low point. And so we can conclude that the confidence interval actually crosses the null hypothesis value of 1.00 by quite a wide margin in fact it's um, it's going down it's crossing down substantially so it's not even statistically significant it's not remotely close to being statistically significant the beta estimate uh, for Tandy RP the same can be said or nearly said about the alpha value here this is what SPSS calls a constant and it's an intercept and the intercept is the value of x when or the value of y when x is 0 and we can see that that value is not very far from 0 it's 0 0.01 and we again have the 95 percent confidence intervals to help us determine whether uh, the deviation from zero is statistically significant or not and because the lower bound estimate for 95 percent confidence is point zero negative point zero zero nine which crosses the point of zero 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 point zero 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 we cannot say that uh, there is a alpha a statistically significant alpha associated with Tandy so same conclusions uh, as the SAS example. Uh, SPSS gives us one more table at the bottom here, and it's uh, similar to what SAS talks about later in terms of testing the assumptions associated with this CAPM analysis, which is linear regression. The residual values uh, have a mean of zero, and this is basically testing the hypothesis of homoscedasticity. Does the linear regression predict equally well across all levels of of the S&P 500 RP variable and when the very when the residuals have a mean of 0 you'd most you'd more likely say probably not unless the distribution is extremely uh non normally distributed and it's bimodal or something like that uh but in this case here we'd be pretty confident that it's that we haven't violated the assumption of homogeneity of uh the strength of the prediction across uh, the S&P 500 variable and we can plot that fairly easily because we've we've got a residual variable that our analysis created in SPSS you might recall that I chose that and we can call this Tandy RP resid and then eliminate this label because it's a very uninformative label and then we go into graphs I like the legacy di dialogues for this kind of thing we go into simple we use S&P 500 RP as our x-axis variable and we use our resid variable as our y-axis variable and it's going to produce the same chart that was produced by uh, SAS in terms of examining the assumption associated with this analysis well one of the assumptions anyway and we can see that uh, basically uh, there's a bird's nest actually here we can even add the linear regression line which in this case is you know flat zero and this output this chart looks very similar I could modify it uh, quite easily to look very very similar to the SAS example uh, with, uh, with a little bit of uh, editing in the chart editor uh, so in conclusion, doing a CAPM analysis, a basic CAPM analysis, is very, very easy to do in SPSS. Uh, you get just as much information, arguably even more information, because you're getting the 95% confidence intervals. Thank you for watching this video.